you so much, Mr. Uh, Lipovsky. We do have a, a list of senators who are eager to ask a question to our witnesses. Uh, Senatrice Sinman, Munson, Deacon, Foreni Singh, Meiji, Eaton, uh, Dasko. Senatrice Sinman. Thank you, merci. Uh, thank you all very much for your presentations. Mr. Lepofsky, I'm gonna take you up on your challenge. So, um, I'm searching for commonalities. I appreciate the, the premises that you made, that we're looking for clear, crisp, focused, and meaningful amendments instead of a hope of being passed on the other side, uh, because that's exactly what's going to have to happen in this process. So, um, I'd like to ask you, Specifically, you submitted three areas that need strengthening um, with 11 amendment, amendments. Um, and I'd like to ask you very specifically about your amendment about timelines. Um, and so it's true that Huma heard testimony around timelines, but they decided not to amend the bill to include a deadline. And you have proposed one. In fact, I think you proposed January 1st, 2040. I'd like to hear from you why you're pushing that we have a timeline and why it would be that particular one. There are two timelines that we've set. One is the, minister, the government should be required, not just permitted, but required to enact accessibility standards regulations within five years. And also the timeline for ultimate accessibility in Canada by 2040. Yes. These were pitched to Huma. The opposition parties, left and right, united in support of that agenda. The government did not agree. Our hope is that if on your sober second thought, you find wisdom drawing on you the, the experience that bring you to this Senate, that a return of this issue to the House in June, months before an election, may lead uh, all members of the House to see the wisdom of adopting them. And, and to be clear, I'm, I'm, I have an appointment to meet the minister this afternoon to bring that message. I'd, we'd like to work with the Senate and the House to see if we could broker a package that covers everything. With respect to the 2040 deadline, I had the privilege of leading the coalition that fought for a decade to win the enactment of Ontario's accessibility law, and I now lead the coalition that's fought for the past 14 years to get it effectively implemented. The minister doubted whether a deadline in the legislation would help. Our frontline grassroots experience of 14 years demonstrates unequivocally that it does. The minister feared that that might lead to a disincentive. People think, oh, you got to wait till 2039 to start. Not only does it, it but we've proposed wording that you can include that will utterly accommodate the minister's worry by making that clear. What we've learned is if you say, yeah, become accessible sometime, next millennium, whenever, action won't happen. If on the other hand, the 2040 deadline is set, Senator, then Air Canada knows. They better read, that deadline overarches their plans, their accessibility requirements. CASDO knows that their standards that they recommend have to meet that requirement and cabinet and all other regulation-making bodies will know that that is the measure. Without that tool, our efforts in Ontario, which have been a hard slog, believe me, would be considerably harder. Thanks, thanks for being here, and I think that uh, uh, we have to acknowledge the work of former Senator David Smith uh, when, uh, David, you talked about the, the charter. He was the, the, the person who led the charge to make sure that that was in the Charter, dealing with disabilities. It had been left out, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that. Two quick questions, one for um, uh, Neil Belanger and one for Mr. Leposky. Uh, Mr. Belanger, if you could answer, you support the bill, but it seems that the Indigenous people have been left off the table. And I can't understand why. I know that there was discussions about nation to nation, but there are more than 600. And so you support it, but you've been left out. And just an answer to that. And to Mr. Leposky, uh, you haven't been much of a fan of uh, CRTC and CTA and others 
uh, you have an amendment here. Uh, so could you explain uh, th that amendment to us and how that would work and what, you know, there's supposed to be no wrong door, but it seems to be a lot of doors. Uh, so if you could get, talk about your amendment to, to get that on the record. So, Mr. Lefosky. Thank you. Uh, sometimes it helps if you got someone uh, who's blind when what you're facing is a bit of a smokescreen. And this no wrong door stuff that you've been hearing about, respectfully, I think has been raised in all of our presence um, by those who've been uh, presenting it as a smokescreen, or at least it's serving that way. What do I mean? Our preference, our strong preference from day one, would be simply one-stop shopping. One agency, one place to go, one body making the regulations. It's quicker, it's more efficient, it's fairer, and it's certainly easier for us. The current regime only serves the interests of uh, organizations that want to use the splintering to make it harder for us. But we know that in the amendments that you're going to be able to pass if, uh, in the next two weeks, that a total rewrite of the major chunks of the bill uh, is not feasible. So what did we do? We said, what could fix it? No wrong door talks about where you get in, not the most important thing. What happens when you get there? And right now we have four agencies with four different procedures, with four different uh, uh, policies and practices. There'll be four different sets of forms, four different potential sets of deadlines. It's a guarantee of chaos for us, but it'll be great for the airlines because they know them. Or the broadcasters, because they know they've been navigating them, and they got they're lawyered up to be able to do that. So what's our solution? A simple amendment that says that the three that the major bodies are required to develop within a timeline that we prescribe a series of processes to harmonize and have essentially the same procedure or as close as possible behind the door when you get there. And we heard yesterday from uh, the leads uh, from those uh, agencies that they've started working together uh, on, uh, on, on their processes, but no commitments whatsoever to ensure that it's the same process. The bill now in sections 94 to 110 prescribes a series of expedited processes uh, at the accessibility a commissioner, and we say, great, if they work expeditiously. But this, neither the CTA nor the CRTC have been experienced by people with disabilities as expeditious, much the reverse. Last point, briefly, you heard yesterday from these agencies who are genuinely, you know, serious in saying, you know, all the stuff they've done and all that sort of thing, and that, that's understandable from them. But can, can I just take you to the front lines for a minute? And I'm just going to tell you my own personal experience. I could aggregate it across all the feedback we get. CTA, their track record historically is pretty lousy. Yeah, they finally got religion three years ago and are starting to work on regulations. They've had a power to do this for over 30 years. Where have they been? As a blind person who travels internationally, I can tell you I dread entering Canadian airspace. Not because we never get service but it's way more reliable, unreliable here than I've seen otherwise. The CRTC, in the U.S., it has been federal law since, I believe, 2016 that cable providers must provide an accessible PVR. In Canada, where's the CRTC? Well, not required here. Should be, but it's not. So please take the track records and understand that our uh, jadedness uh, is well justified, but our solution is what you can do in a short period, uh, and that is at least require the other agencies, if we're stuck with them, to come up with not just pro uh, uh, statements to you yesterday about how they want to be expeditious, but actually require them to come up with processes that will be expeditious. That's what our amendment proposes. Thank you all for, for being here. I do think my one key question just got answered, but I'm processing uh, the information we're receiving this morning. So I'm going to uh, 
I go with my second back to Ms. Belanger around the Indigenous piece, and I'm 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 hearing your response to Senator Munson this morning, and I'm thinking about how we ensure we get this right. And so I just want to again, if you don't mind, um, ask you when we look at the present uh, uh, bill as it is, and we look at the areas of that bill to ensure that we get this right, what do you think must be included in an amendment? The bill as it stands today? Or yes. are we talking about for a specific First Nations legislation? The bill as it stands today. So I would, I would just uh, echo uh, the recommendations made from FALA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, you know, the ASL, the ones I've touched on here, but particularly in relation to the board as well, Regardless of a First Nations distinct legislation or not, there should be Indigenous representation. We need that on there as well. Communication, uh, timelines to achieving, all the recommendations that the Senate has received, we would support. Okay, thank you. And I just thank you for that. And just to come back um, to Ms. Mr. Leposky, I'm going to come right back to Senator Sediment, and that is the whole concept of that balance of uh, getting this through I mean, I just can't help but bring this up just one more time. You know, getting this through in an efficient and expedient and respectful way and balancing what are uh, significant uh, concerns and amendments that in many cases are kind of related to now we have this, let, how, do we, how do we make sure the stuff gets done? And the answer is, um, is two things. First, we're used to uphill, uh, mm -hmm. battling uphill. Mm -hmm. Doing disability rights advocacy is kind of like swimming up uh, Niagara Falls, mm -hmm. but that doesn't deter us. We mm -hmm. keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So when they, the people who are kind of more jittery, and, oh, we better just take what we can get and all that stuff, like, I, I get that. But you know what? We've never taken that view. Mm -hmm. And we've stared down the risks. If we took that view, we wouldn't have gotten a disability amendment in 1982, we probably would have settled for a weak accessibility law passed in Ontario in 2001 rather than mm -hmm. standing our ground and getting a stronger one in 2005. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we've got all three parties that voted for this law in the, in the House, though the opposition said it's too weak. Mm -hmm. We've written all the party leaders saying, hey, look, we, we want to take this risk off the table, so will you promise party leaders uh, if this bill doesn't make it through, you'll bring it back in the fall. So we're putting the heat on them. But we're putting even more heat on them. We're, we're saying we want to come back with, with amendments from the Senate if the Senate agrees. And we want them decided on in time for this bill to get properly considered, do whatever you got to do, and whether it's passed with the amendments or not, that can be dealt with uh, before the House rises. And they've got the shared pressure of all the groups you've heard from that are jointly saying, please get this thing through. So the pressure will be on them. But we also have the good fortune that we've got opposition parties, and we're nonpartisan, but which we're supporting amendments in the House. So they, we're, we're hoping, and I'm going to be seeing the minister this afternoon, that they will see the wisdom of, of, of strengthening things. And the final thing I'm going to say to you, you Senator, because it's, it's a legitimate concern, but I think it's a concern that's been answered. Minister Qualtro answered your concern last week. She did not say to you, Senator Munson asked her, and, and I appreciate Senator Munson asking her, are you open to amendment? Now, she could have said, look, it's too tight, we're too busy, no. we're not going to be able to get mm. it through, please just approve it. That's not what she said. And she knew as much as everybody else in this room, and you all know, about the legislative timelines in the House. She probably knows more because she's, she's part of the government. Mm -hmm. So she said to you, no, they're open to amendments, and she said, we want this to be the best bill it possibly can be. Now, the fact of the matter is, with our short three pages of amendments covering a few core issues that cut across what the deputants said at HUMA and the issues they've raised here, that these will help move in the direction that she said she's open to. So I suggest you take her up and hold her to what she said. Thank you. Before we conclude uh, this meeting, Senator Miji. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Mr. Lepofsky. It seems to me that you have participated and cooperated in the um, drafting of rights in Ontario. 
for disabled persons. Quick CV. 1980. I just wanted to add to my question. Did they have a timetable? Because I want to know if they did have a timetable. Was there a real movement to get uh, this legislation in place? At place, and I had the privilege of leading that movement, and it was passed unanimously in 2005. The idea of the deadline, 2025, came from the government, not from us. And the minister who brought it in came to the uh, the House committee here and said, "You should do it too." Uh, and we agree with her. She it was a great idea, and we jumped on it and said it was great. It may not be as quick as we'd like, but it got action going. Uh, are they on schedule now? No, but we've had, th you work, Senator, your colleagues were asking questions about the five-year review. We've had three of these reviews in Ontario. Their core job is to say, are we on schedule? And all three reviews demonstrated, the most recent one in the most blistering terms, no, we're not, and we need strong action. Now, if we didn't have that deadline, their review could be informative, but it certainly wouldn't have the message that it does, that we are far behind schedule. This came up in question period as recently as, two days, as yesterday in the Ontario legislature. It's a critical tool. Let me give you one more example, because you, you're asking, will this help? Toronto Transit Commission runs a subway. Got a whole bunch of subway stations. Half of them have no elevator, approximately. But to its credit, the TTC has a plan to make them all accessible by 2025 because they've read the Ontario legislation. Now, the, actually, the Ontario government has not passed a regulation addressing subway stations. But the mere presence of that date in the, regulation, in the legislation itself has led this major subway to adopt that plan. Let me tell you one more thing. They tried to back down from that plan a few years ago and push it back. And we went to the media and said, not fair, the act says 2025. And that media pressure led the TTC to back down and stick to 2025. If the minister's approach to this legislation had prevailed in Ontario, we would be further behind in getting those subway stations accessible. Merci. Senatrice Dasco. Um, hi, David. How are you? Nice Donna Dasco. Here. Person. Nice, nice, to, nice to be here. Nice to see you in person. Um, I'm just going to focus uh, very specifically on your meeting with the minister this afternoon. Uh, and in the interests of being efficient and especially effective, um, I wonder if uh, in your meeting with the minister, if you could focus her mind on what she would be willing to do and if you could get back to us with any insights that you uh, or uh, promises, pledges, intelligence, anything you can, because that will help us move forward, um, given the time frame that's left, given the suggestions that, that you have for us, uh, which me, which in my mind seem like serious and extensive, uh, but maybe it's all easy. <laughs> I'm a new, I'm a new senator. So, uh, um, uh, I'm, so that is my question to you. If you can learn from the minister what she would be willing to do, I'm not saying that will determine what we do, but that will help yes. us very much in what we do because then we will understand what, what might be doable and what we might be able to, all of us in the end, what we might hope to uh, expect and, and get from, from the process. 
Can you can you <laughs> can I ask you that uh, question? As, yeah. as a deputant who's notorious for long wordy answers, <laughs> my answer is yes. Okay, well, we'll look forward to getting back to you. And I know Senator Omidbar has a question as well. Senator Omidbar. At least somebody else has maybe more. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope to be brief. Thank you, all of you, for coming here. And thank you, Mr. Lepofsky, for the correspondence you have, under, uh, you have been in with not just me, but everyone. I'd like to probe um, your assessment of the capacity, the competency, of the CTA and the CRTC um, on disability accessibility. Uh, they were here yesterday. I quoted to them a section of your letter, rather blistering assessment of their lack of progress. Um, and they, in turn, um, uh, responded by talking about the great pride they have in the progress they have made. And I will quote from a brief submitted to this committee from the CRTC. They talk about the history of their progress. In the mid-1980s, they mandated TTY relay services. In 2009, they, they, it was expanded to include the provision of IP relay services. Five years later, the provision of video relay services. A 911 service is currently mandated. In 2009, the CRTC began to require broadcasters to, pro to provide described video services four hours per week. Would you still use the word lousy to describe their progress? Only in and public and private, they might be slightly more colorful. Okay, yeah, tell us what you can. Uh, and, I, and I say this not just to be glib, um, but uh, let me, we're not saying they did nothing. And full disclosure, Scott Streiner, the head of the CTA, is a good guy with a strong background in human rights. If you could pass an amendment making him immortal, uh, we'd vote for it, okay? But I, I don't know if you got authority. No. Uh, that may be provincial. Um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, I say two things in terms of these agencies. The first is, they do not have core expertise. They are not there. They are experts in broadcasting and in transit. They are not experts in accessibility. That's what the accessibility commissioner will be. I will say, I lied, brief things. The second thing I'm going to say is just look at their track record. CTA, three decades, their own draft regulation out for comment now acknowledges that they haven't done enough. Why couldn't they have done some of this Years ago, we didn't just invent people with disabilities using airplanes or trains. This is not news, and it's not rocket science. And the final thing I'd say, where's their, and this is what our amendment focuses on, they have labyrinthian procedures which are designed for major regulatory uh, decision making. I, I get that, but it's not suited to us. That's why credit to the government in its design of sections 94 to 110 to come up with something that's even more streamlined than the sometimes labyrinthian process at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. But we need those other agencies to, uh, to talk not just about no wrong door, which they all talk to you about, but equal fast procedures, comparable procedures once you get behind that door. And I didn't hear them saying they were going to do that or certainly didn't hear them commit to doing that. That's why we need this amendment. Okay. Fine. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Omidvar. Uh, uh, and I know that we are running over time a little bit, but uh, I think... Uh, Persons with disability in Canada, and, and I'm part of that community, have been waiting for this bill for over 40 years, uh, so uh, we, we may take uh, an extra five minutes. Et j'aimerais poser, I, I, I want to ask a quick question, uh, uh, Madame Desforges, le focus a été beaucoup sur l'expérience ontarienne. Ms. Desforges, we've been focusing on the Ontario experience, but I'd like you to talk to us about, and we're tra talking about the French language, you talked about disabled people, and Senator Cormier in the House said that we should perhaps 
talk about people in who are disabled, should we make an observation to this effect? Well, yes, Canada has just uh, signed the protocol. I think it might be a good idea to put it in the legislation in Quebec. We're always talking about handicapped or disabled persons. So the two uh, pieces of legislation could uh, be harmonized. Sometimes it's said uh, the other expression is person in a situation of disability. Your excellent question. It's been very valuable for the study of Bill C-81. And on that note, unless there are uh, other questions or, or business, I will declare this meeting adjourned.